funds. So when those funds are finally collected, we do enjoy and we do receive, and you'll notice in our budget identified the county. So we do get interest and penalties on our portion. <coughs> Every little bit helps, and that over the course of a year can add up to maybe twenty, fifty thousand dollars sometimes in five years or something like that. So it's usually more in the two thousand a year anyway. Yeah, that's that. great. And we have a budget for that. It was really just extra money that we came to the day. It's just a matter of how much. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lieber. You're welcome. We appreciate it. And now let's take a roll call vote to adopt financial reports. Uh, all in favor of adopting the financial report, please raise your hand. Looks like uh, seven votes in favor. Okay, thank you. Moving on to new business, item six uh, is the Venice Beach bid assessment. The board will discuss whether or not to increase assessment in 2020. Uh, our treasurer, Steve Human, and Tara Devine, take it away. Um, so the Venice Beach Business Improvement District um, was uh, formed in 2017 um, due, to some due to litigation and some other factors. The bid did not launch until 2018. Um, assessments um, were refunded uh, in 2017. In 2018, due to our late start, we did have um, we do have some carryover funds. Um, we are enormously lucky to have those. Um, that late start is is absolutely. I cannot emphasize how critical that is to us providing quality services throughout the remaining life of the bid. Um, without those, we would be absolutely crippled um, by the impacts. Um, the largest single impact um, to us is the uh, tremendous increase in the minimum wage. Um, our bid cycle uh, coincides exactly with the five years of increases um, to the minimum wage. Um, there is uh, a handout in the back, some of you may have, the board has in their packets. Um, the minimum wage increases in the city of Los Angeles each year on July 1. Our bid assessment um, increases actually occur on a calendar year basis in January. However, property owners um, receive their first bill to those in the fall. Um, so we must submit um, any cha proposed changes to our assessment um, this month in order for the city clerk to review those and send that information to the assessor so that it can be included on the fall property tax bills. Um, so our reality, um, and we have uh, managed to blunt the impact of this tremendously, I would say through two things. Part of it is our carryover funds. Part of it is that we have just exercised extreme fiscal prudence um, from the get-go with the bid. Um, but the reality is uh, that um, from when we were formed to the present, Bid assessments have been raised 5%. There was a 5%, which is the maximum we can increase in any given year. The board did adopt the 5% increase last year. In that same timeline, the minimum wage rose 32.5%. Oh. Um, for those of you who have seen or looked at our budget in more detail, um, you would probably be aware of this, um, but the vast majority of our budget is either labor or costs that are directly impacted by labor. I can, the only single expense we have that I cannot think that is not affected by the minimum wage increase, arguably, would be our rent. Um, other than that, I mean, everything we do is affected directly by the minimum wage. Our folks who work primarily in the field are a step above minimum wage, but when minimum wage goes up, we have to step up their pay accordingly to do that. Um, so every single increase in the minimum wage hits us and hits probably about 80% or more of our budget. Um, I would say with a few exceptions, we have also seen the costs of related goods and services, our overhead, our supplies, our copier service technician, all that stuff, our dumpster fee, all that stuff is also going up by at least the cost of living and in some instances more than that. Um, so, uh, I think what, uh, and I would be happy to discuss this in a bit more detail. Um, we, Steve uh, Human, our, my treasurer, uh, uh, and I 
I have undertaken um, a multi-year look, a projection of what our expenses will be um, running through the end of the bid cycle because we understand intuitively that despite being healthy today, that realistically we do not have the assessment revenue to keep pace with these increases. Um, so we have undertaken to the best of our ability. There are many unknowns. There are many things that are not possible to predict precisely. But we have done um, some uh, what we feel are reasonable and responsible budget projections through 2021. And at the current rate of services, um, and I would also remind folks, um, this bid was not uh, at its inception, it was not budgeted for five day or for seven day a week service. However, when the bid launched in uh, May of 2018, um, we really took a look at the district. Our vendors really expressed to us their concern about not having seven day a week coverage. And so we identified at that time when we launched, initially what we authorized was the initial X number of months we were going to do the seven day a week service. I think every member of the board has been convinced since then, um, Venice is not a five day a week district, we are a seven day a week district. Um, and so I think there is, uh, for the most part, I think there was a, a, a pretty strong commitment on, on certainly on the staff recommendation level um, that this district needs seven day a week service. And so our goal is to try to continue to provide that. However, based on our budget projections, um, even with last year's 5% increase, and even if the board were to pass medium to high increases this year, we are, uh, are, are tentatively projecting um, that we really need to look at cutting about $200,000 um, more than we have already planned for from our budget between now and 2021. And so from a fiscally responsible perspective, those, those cuts are much more modest, um, much less impactful if we begin those now. Um, there may be additional opportunities for savings. We are certainly also cutting on the admin level. Um, we have left our number two position vacant um, for the entirety of this year so far. Um, we have really worked hard to negotiate with all of our vendors the most reasonable cost for services. Um, we are very judicious on the supplies and everything else that we do. Um, so I would say that our organization really tries to treat um, the property owner's money in this district as if it were our own and exactly as responsibly as we would want anyone else to spend it. So that said, we have asked, um, and one of the things, uh, we're not presenting specific cuts today. Um, but I would say to the board that we will be having discussions in the future about how to um, cut approximately $200,000 from our uh, clean and safe programs over the next two and a half years. Um, there, we believe that if we undertake that now and institute that sooner rather than later, there is a greater chance that um, we will not need to cut that much and we'll be able to potentially restore the higher level of services as we go. But we want to exercise fis fiscal caution. So, um, also, um, in addition to the fact that um, assessments have risen 5%, and the minimum rate rose 32.5%, that's going to continue not as, not as badly as it has, um, but from now until the end of the bid term, if the board were to raise 5% this year and 5% next year, compounded that would be 10 and a quarter percent. Um, during those two years, the minimum wage will rise another 13.2%. So I will also say to the board, we cannot raise assessments to raise our way out of this problem. We do need to look at budget cuts um, in order to remain on our fiscal responsible path. It, so the increase is really reflective of um, it will affect to a degree the magnitude of those cuts. Um, 5%, uh, each 1% assessment increase is rough, roughly provides us with an extra $20,000. So a 5% increase in any given year, that yields about $100,000 to us. Um, uh, and as I mentioned, the projected need to cut about $200,000, uh, that 
already takes into account um, or anticipates at least something akin to a cost of living increase for the next two years. Um, the cost of living increase for LA, I believe for this year is estimated about 2.1, 2.2 uh, roughly. Um, and then also the other thing to keep in mind is that um, all of this is cumulative. You know, this decisions today compound in the future. So once the minimum wage increases are complete in 2021, in subsequent years, they have been tied to the Bureau of Labor Statistics um, cost of living index. So the minimum wage is also important to realize will continue to rise after the $15 rate has been achieved. Um, so um, it, is always, it is always difficult to recommend um, that um, any of you who have already very generously um, paid uh, much of your hard-earned money to provide the services that we do, it is always hard to sit here and say to you that costs are rising, but the reality is is that at some point on a fiscal level, um, when a bid does not increase its assessments roughly in line with the cost of living, um, you do in time create a systemic deficit. We have been fortunate we could be in vastly worse shape. Um, our surplus from our late start last year is really a, a huge saving grace for us. Um, our level of service would be noticeably different without it. Um, but we project that that surplus at the current rate of services, we would have exhausted that um, sometime in the second half of next year, uh, between fall and December. So we must make some adjustments now in order to minimize the amount of impact we have talked to our vendors, we have identified um, a variety of ways we might achieve those with the least impact to services, um, and I think uh, we feel as good about it as we can. Um, but if the board were asking me for a recommendation today, I would say that I think in light of where we're at, in light of how little we've increased in the, in the, in the wake of the minimum wage increase, I would recommend that the board seriously consider at least an increase that is roughly in line with cost of living increase. So I would recommend that um, I think at least a 3% increase is fiscally responsible in light of the larger economic circumstances of the world. And Steve may want to add some things to that as well, um, and then we'll open up for discussion. I mean, I, I think Tara covered the facts very well. Um, I would just go back and say that, um, you know, the reason we find ourselves here um, largely has to do with the fact that minimum wage was increased after we formed the bid and, and had uh, already had our uh, management district plan uh, created. And so we had no opportunity to understand that there was going to be a drastic increase in minimum wage and, and we're not against a minimum wage increase but we didn't have the opportunity to plan for that um, so we have to on the other hand we do have to live with the ramifications of that um, i would you know remind everyone that if we go you know each because we have a two million dollar budget one percent increase is a twenty thousand dollar increase so if we go up three percent we are going up sixty thousand dollars on our annual uh, assessments total uh, five percent is a hundred thousand um, dollars and i would also just remind everyone that it's not your property taxes that'll go up out of the increase it's your assessment and your assessment is not your total property tax bill um, but i think tara covered it extremely well um, you know we have discussed this with our service providers um, and, and they're aware of it and they will you know do uh, the best they can uh, we will i think see some impacts but still be very um, effective not concerned about our effectiveness, but I do think that, you know, we might see some impacts on the street from those impacts.
that's, you know, I just want to, as the treasurer, lay out the facts and make sure they're clear and out there. When the board starts discussing, I can put on my other hat of board member. So also to give you an idea, um, a 5% increase, uh, if you look at somebody, say a condo owner in our district, I would say, we have different sizes, but median condo assessment would probably be somewhere around $300, perhaps a bit less. Um, a $300 bid assessment with a 5% increase would see the bill rise to $315. Um, likewise, a, property, a commercial property owner who has a $3,000 assessment would see their assessment rise to $150. So thinking about it in terms of dollars is helpful. I just also want to throw that out there in terms of what, um, what the increases look like. What's our average assessment? I, I don't know what it is, but I think uh, on a typical um, property, you know, she just gave you some good numbers, mm -hmm. the $300 for, for a typical residential condo. And then I think, um, I believe we have a property on the boardwalk that's around $3,000 that um, is not at the end of a block. So if you're at the end of a block, it could be closer to five dollars or $6,000. And of course there are properties with much greater yeah. assessments. So um, what's your, if you know this, what's your assessment on that building? The, the, uh, on the building you just described? The, 3,000, just oh, under 3,000, how many square feet? Uh, that, that one is um, about 40 feet wide by say 100 or 80 feet, something like that, 100 feet. Um, <laughs> Just as a reminder, assessment in, in districts that provide predominantly clean and safe services, assessments are generally, in certainly in California and also in some other states, they tend to be heavily weighted on the frontage because that's where most of our services are delivered. So the larger the frontage of your property, and frontage does not just mean the front, frontage means any side of the property that is serviced, that is publicly accessible and serviced. So in, in Venice, um, most properties have two sides of frontage, the front and the rear, but corner parcels um, can have three, or once in a while you have standalone parcels like the MTA, the Metro lot. Metro lot has four sides, so it is assessed on all four sides. So wherever there is a street, alley, curb, gutter, where we are providing those clean and safe services, that is assessed, and the vast majority of the assessment is based on the frontage of the property. A very small amount of it is based on the size of your lot or the height, the, the amount of building square footage you have, but it, it's relatively small. Um, it's eight cents for each square foot of building, 11 cents for each square foot of lot, and um, depending upon whether it's zone one or zone two, it, in zone one it is $29 a square foot for, um, uh, for frontage. frontage, and it's $14.50. These are actually slightly off because of the 5%, there was a 5% increase. So but we, we are lucky that the city were, pays a, a, a nice. All, all of the city property um, uh, pays an assessment in our district and we are also fortunate, um, uh, the state owns some money. sizable property um, in our district as well. It's not just us. And the state, um, uh, the state's position is that they are not for it because they have a long-term agreement. They have a, going back decades, agreement with the city of Los Angeles. Um, the city of Los Angeles, um, under that agreement, deems itself responsible for the state assessments, so they pay the state assessments as well. But I feel like it's important to know that our money is magnified by the city's involvement. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, our district, I, 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 from the very beginning, I looked at, it, Venice is a district where it, it's public property is, is so much more a part of this area than it is in most areas of the city. Your entire um, western flank is all government-owned property, and then you also have, you have southern, on the southern end, and in some other areas, you have really significant public parcels that are just absolutely instrumental and, and an ingrained part of everything else that is here. And one of, I think, one of the challenges to creating a business improvement district here long before we did was um, was an understanding of how do you create a bid that has so much public property in it? Because if the public property isn't part of it, you don't really have a bid that's going to be able to address the community and make it clean and safe. Um, 
So I, I have to say, I think we all have to say thank you. Um, Council Member Bonin was very supportive of forming the bid and very supportive of including the city property that is an essential part of this district. And I think it is absolutely, um, it, has, it has been absolutely essential to actually being able to make this community clean and safe. If that public, part, if that public property were not part of the bid, there would be so much we would be unable to address and so much that would frustrate um, and, and I think um, continue to aggravate the members of the community. So we're grateful for that. Have we received but, any uh, written correspondence or any other comment from uh, members about the assessment? No, we have not received any written um, comment, email letters um, to date uh, in regards to the assessment we've received. Okay. I mean, Go ahead, John. In response to your comment about the size of the government properties, I think it's also worth noting that they are the magnet for the problems that we are organized to actually confront. So that the it's appropriate for them to be involved. Yeah, yeah it's I absolutely mean, appropriate. I agree. It isn't like I mean, like I mean stack the deck to be able the, to. No, but the city like, stepped up when they otherwise might not have. Yeah. But it is appropriate for them okay. to have done so. Okay. Chances are we would not be in well, let's, need. Well, let's discuss the number. Let's because that's what we really. That's where we're going. Let, let's discuss the number and then we'll make a motion and have further discussion. Does anyone have any comments on on the number? We recommended three percent or greater. We increased five percent in two thousand seventeen. We have in Jeremy. You you take the floor. <laughs> Since you wanted to bring up numbers, I, well, I mean, we're we got way off topic about everything else other than what we're going to talk about, which is what we're going to do about a number. Um, and I mean, the information out, right, out, outline tells us that you know, based upon going from twelve dollars in two thousand seventeen to fifteen dollars an hour, that we need to try and keep up with inflation. Um, making sure that we have the best team in place to do the work that that's required. Um, uh, do I make the motion for five percent? I don't know. It's, just, it's a big number. It's, it's, the only, it's the only thing that seems to make any sense. Anyone else have any comments on well, the number? Well, I mean, in line with what Jeremy's saying, I, I think the fiscally responsible choice is five percent, but I also think that we can't only operate in a fiscal from a fiscal perspective. We have to look at the community around us. We have to look at um, how our stakeholders feel or might feel, because I'm not sure that we know exactly, um, about an increase. And, you know. Uh, do, do we know, does anybody know just what CPI was from year over year from? Uh, I, I believe for this year it was 2.1 or 2.2. I remember 3.3, but yeah, okay. But we're in that neighborhood. My sense is that we're talking about wages. Our, our biggest cost is our wages. They've gone up substantially more than CPI. So a CPI base would be unrealistic to keep up with in terms of the costs. It, and it will. allotted 5% is our max, I believe, is a bit. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's probably set there for a good reason because the actual costs tend to increase in time above and beyond CPI because the amount of work that needs to be done becomes clearer and to not be able to perform that work would sort of undercut what we're here to do. So I would think the 5% is a fair um, next step. So, so Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, the latest report is April of this year um, and they reported a 3.1% 3 increase over last year year for the prior 12 month period so for the LA. prior 12 months yeah. for LA County yes <clears throat> so bids are given the latitude to raise up to 5% every year and if you think of CPI in the neighborhood of 0 to 5% that would be perfect to allow a bid to keep up with inflation um, it's actually the metro area. what happened to us is we didn't provide services the first year and four months. And so we did not raise assessments um, in that first year. However, minimum wage went through the roof 
and minimum wage continues to go through the roof. So our, like I said, you know, our opportunity, yeah, there's no way that 5%, even if we had done it the first year and been operational from day one, there's no way that 5% could keep pace with uh, the minimum wage increases. And so then we're, you know, figuring out what services do we provide? And we've really worked with Allied and with Chrysalis to provide a base level of services that can service the district. Um, and I remember a conversation with Trevor from Chrysalis early on when we were first, you know, really able to look at the amount of money we had approved versus the actual bid from Chrysalis and the other bids that came in, and we saw there was a disparity. Um, it wasn't something we could necessarily predict early on. In fact, just to go back er early on, we the steering committee was presented with three different budgets, and we all opted for the highest one because we wanted to do the job correctly out here. Um, but when we took a look at the money we had to spend and Chrysalis and other bids, we said, you know, hey, Trevor, you know, I'm not sure we're gonna be able to spend this. We might only be able to spend that. And Trevor said, well, here's my concern. I don't really even wanna be involved if we can't service the bid at a level that it needs to be serviced at, because otherwise we'll fail, it won't work. Uh, so, we have been fortunate to have that surplus from the first four months, and we have been fortunate to have amazing service providers that have really done worked with us, worked with us and allowed <coughs> us to watch the money carefully. Um, however, this minimum wage thing just outpaces what we can do, and so now we're looking at cutting. Do we have uh, do we have a proposal from our service providers of what the budgets are going to look like for future years? Because you know, even though wages go up, uh, our cost of service because we've got a third party contractor doesn't necessarily feel the full blunt of it. Well, it, it does because they have based their contracts on that, and um, yeah. So it does. The only, um, the only but what we did is we projected, based on the contracts, where we would be, and we went back to them after we saw the shortfall, and we said, you know, can you work with us on this, this two hundred thousand dollars? And they now, you know, they feel that they can. We will see an impact. Um, but we will also be able to handle everything. I'm not sure how big the impact will be. You know, they, they are better at their jobs now too, um, and we are smarter at how to deploy, so there's some efficiency there. Um, and in the end, we're talking about $200,000 over the next two and a half years and that 200 is a maybe. It could be more and it could be less, depending on how things actually go, um, because the projections are just projections. And every percentage that we increase is $20,000. So if we do 3% or 5%, it's a $40,000 difference. So, I mean, it's a chunk of that $200,000 shortfall. Uh, it is. Um, a typical month costs us, in, you know, the $135,000, $150,000 range for services and other overhead. Various, I'm probably not counting everything, but services alone were, you know, in the $130,000 range in the summer, I would say. So, just to kind of frame it and put it all in perspective. Um, we, we also, we, we um, just so you know as a bid as well, we, we approve very, very little overtime. 
we have um, approved some overtime as necessary for court appearances and in a few very select circumstances for like on a busy holiday weekend occasionally we've approved an extra shift to deal with trash because it goes up so much or things like that but the amount of overtime overtime is approved on a case-by-case -case basis and I don't think we've spent I don't think we spent on 13 40 hours of overtime in the last year and we, we get the job done with regular hours which also really helps keep the cost down too so I think what I'd like to do is um, ask for a motion to increase the assessment 5% uh, for the, the 2019. Yes, so this this increase in assessment would be seen on the fall property tax okay. bills that are for next calendar year. Okay, so we wouldn't see, uh, so, the, we so won't see the money until next year. I want to make a motion that we can further discuss the number. Uh, I'm going to ask for a motion. Is there a motion to increase the assessment 5%? Uh, for the next calendar year. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion. Okay. Can you increase the base 5%? Is there a second? Hold on, wait a minute. Okay, <laughs> we're gonna discuss it, so it's gonna get shot <laughs> down or let's but, but for the purpose of discussion. So pr procedurally, the motion yeah. requires a second, second to proceed or else it dies. I'll second it doesn't. Motion. Okay. Okay, and now that it has second, we Let's would discuss, discuss this, and, discuss it, and it either passes or fails, and if it fails, then someone else can make a new motion for a different amount. This is also not our last year. If this surplus, or if this additional 5% becomes a surplus, can it carry over? Um, so from one year to the next, we may carry over funds. The city is always looking at that and scrutinizing it. Because of the exceptional cert, typically speaking, the city does not like to see large carryover amounts from year to year. But however, because of our late start and because the city also understands we are not the only bid, we're just one of the worst impacted by the minimum wage um, because of when our cycle finds up with it. But many bids across the city have, have really struggled with this issue as well and have had to do cuts and other things. Um, so because of that, we've had, we have tolerance for higher rollover. Um, at the end, so if the question is year to year within our bid, within our five year cycle, yes, we can carry over money from one year to the next. We should be prepared to explain how much we're carrying over and why and how it will be expended in the subsequent years. When we get to the end of the bid cycle at 2021, um, generally speaking, we don't want to carry over a lot of funds, um, but some is typical um, for two reasons. Um, just from a cash flow perspective, um, uh, it can be it can be helpful, but there are, there are different rules that apply. Carryover funds from one bid cycle to the next, if the bid is renewed, can only be expended on one-time projects, so they can't be used for regular operational costs, etc. Um, so generally speaking, the goal is to get to the end of the bid cycle with a modest amount of carryover funds, but not an exceptionally large amount. Even if we go with five percent now, it could mean allowing us, could give us insurance to do what we need to do and allow us the freedom to increase less later, if at all, in yes, the next two years. Steve and I have set ourselves up so that we will be able, in, in a much more real-time basis, to continue to update those numbers and yeah. see how we're doing. So I, I think we'd both be thrilled to be sitting here next year telling you, hey, implementing those cuts has put us in a better fiscal position this year and we actually don't think we're going to end up needing to cut that much. It's less than we thought. So in other words, I think our goal is to institute some cuts sooner so it's less painful and we can see how that goes. And then we have a little more latitude in bringing those up or down as budget um, uh, as we get ongoing real assessment of our burn rate and, and cash flow with it. So, so, so thank you. Uh, so, so here's here's the way I look at this. So this is, in a way, it's a it's a self report card, and we're representing the entire all the members, all the property owners who are paying into this, and um, so we're, we're we have skin in this game, um, and we're deciding to increase our own assessment along with uh, a lot of people who aren't here today, and so we have a tremendous responsibility. And I look at this in terms of we're facing 
sort of a two hundred thousand dollar shortfall, if you will, but with really an artificially inflated number because of the late start. But it gave us a nice way to enter this community uh, when we started service in Spain last year. And I will say that as a an SSE, uh, I look at the tremendous change and impact that this bid has made since we started services. And that's why I suggest the 5% increase for ourself, myself, and the rest of the, rest of the assessees. We've made impact on graffiti. Paul and his crew are out, and otherwise that graffiti would fester every day and become worse. The quality of life in, in just on the effect of the graffiti for me is, is, um, is terrible, and I noticed a big change there. Uh, we have, uh, we, we work on art projects. We have things to dedicate and we can help assist with certain projects. Um, we've cleaned up sort of a, a floating barge, which uh, under your direction, Tara, in the canals was a blight and a, a criminal magnet, unfortunately. And these resources cost money. Environmental uh, hazard. Environmental hazard. Um, we do tremendous cleanup of everything from from, from needles, um, unfortunately, and sadly, uh, to uh, a lot of dirt and trash. Um, I look at the numbers every month when we, we put out the graphic. Mm -hmm. We've picked up thousands of bags of trash, okay, and covered thousands of graffiti bags. And we made a real positive impact in this community. I have people coming up to me, uh, neighbors who are not assessees, who are impressed with the work we did. I have people who are assessed who thank me and thank Chrysalis and the and allied and the people in the field who work every day and work hard. The minimum wage increase, even though it's 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 actually if you look at it from 2017 through the end of the bid, it's it's 47.7 percent increase, but it's still a paltry number for people trying to live in the city and and uh, even at 15 dollars. Thank you for um, saying that. And yeah. and it's a, it's a low number. Um, and I'm glad that, that we can help pass on whatever we can. And we're also doing good by really hiring locally, okay? That was something that was a goal of ours early on, and we've done it successfully. And, and I think that I'm proud of that. So for me, it is an increase. I'm willing to take it on because I'm proud of the work of this organization and the people that work for this organization. and the contributions of this board, and I can say confidently that I think it's a, it's, it's a good investment, and we won't please everyone with the 5% increase, but I think we're doing what's right for the sake of this bid and being as successful as we possibly can be through the duration of this term and moving into uh, a second term. So that's my two cents. I hate to always be the, <laughs> I hate to always be the, but I, I agree 110% with everything Mark said. Um, my position is that I hate to see massive increases every year. And I, because I was a part of the conversation with the vendors and because we, we felt we can keep the quality up, meet the minimum wage, and maybe feel a little bit pinched, but at 3%, it felt like we could do it all and at least give people a little bit of relief, even though the amounts are small. So I would feel more comfortable, since we raised the 5% last time, doing a 3% this time, because I feel like it is a cost of living increase. And while I agree that expenses are going up more, I feel like doing that not only shows the community our fiscal responsibility, but says, okay, you know, we're gonna put our own feet to the fire and hold the tightest rein we possibly can. Now, again, I'm one time vote, so I'm not, but, but to be fair. You're the same vote as everyone else. Yep. Yeah, but I'm just, to be fair, that's, that's where, where I came away from our budget meetings with that as a, as a takeaway. 
because it felt like we could give something to everybody that way and meet our obligations, continue doing all the work that we are doing because everything you said is true. And I can also see that the 5% increase is like, okay, we can do that. And, but, but I think a little bit left out of the conversation was that both of our vendors felt that they could keep up the level of service and still make those cuts because of what Kara was saying, because we I, more we, I would clarify for the board, there will be reductions in hours or shifts. So the people who <coughs> suffer so are the are the people earning there are wage. there are impacts. It's in other words, we won't, impact. we yeah, won't get impact. it we won't make all these savings through efficiencies. Some of the uh, uh, majority of these savings will come from reductions in shifts, but if we believe that if we do it strategically, that it will have minimal impact. And, and those those cuts are going to happen whether we raise it three percent, four or five percent. So the, yes, it's the degree so of the correct. Cuts. So the degree I, I, of those cuts varies so a little bit. Yeah. And, and I, I respect I, I respect I you, respect Connie. I respect I, I respect yes. your position. I really do. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's it's I think it's fair, and you make a lot of fair points. My concern is the $200,000 number, um, which is looming, and as well as sort of other increases that we're gonna see sort of uh, in other staff salaries and costs. And this, to me, a couple percent increase right. will blunt that dump. Um, and it will compound and, and help us. So, and, I and I think, Jay, I, I totally you, get you, it. you raised the point that um, the city is also will also be paying a, um, a their share. It's the best money we can spend on the subject, uh, I think. Uh, approximately $400,000 would be subject to, um, under my motion, a 5% increase, which is city funds. We're in a humanitarian crisis in Los Angeles okay. now. We've all seen what's happening on the news, and it's a shame. It's a crisis, and um, I hope it gets better, but we have to brace for getting worse, in my opinion, and to bolster our finances um, a couple more percent. I'm willing to do it because I see the impact here. I see what we're doing. And I'm glad we can pass some of that on to people working for Chrysalis and Allied and everywhere else. Oh, absolutely. Um, I'm really glad that we can do that. So I, 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 I want to mention real quickly that um, the 200,000 presupposes 3% this year and 5% next year. In, in rough terms, again, because it's not projection, but I, I want you to understand that it's not, you know, it could be more, it could be less, depending on what we do here today, as well as unknowns. Another, we are gonna institute these cuts, um, and it is our hope that if we do this sooner rather than later, that we'll be able to loosen those up or perhaps eliminate some of those down the road. Um, but we think the fiscally responsible thing to do is to do some cutting now, um, and see if we can make some incremental cuts that have the least impact on our ability to provide the same level of service. Um, but we are talking about eliminating um, a couple of shifts or positions, so um, that is the reality. Even with an increase in assessments, we have to deal with that. Um, but yes, both things that are being said are true, which is, we have to live within our budget and we are going to have to do some cutting now to make sure that we are fiscally responsible moving forward and perhaps we can loosen those cuts as we go along based on our actual expenditures. Um, and yes, the other thing is conversely true. It is, to think about it in a nutshell, each 1% is about $20,000 a year to us. It's not huge in and of itself, but the other thing to keep in mind is that over time it is cumulative, that compounds. So that is why, for example, I would say, in my opinion, it would be fiscally irresponsible to have a 0% increase, because not only is that about today and not acknowledging the fact that costs have increased 3% this year, but that is also compounding your troubles in future years, and I would say none of us are, are I don't think anybody in this room is an economist, but it doesn't look like costs or the CPI is gonna drop considerably in the near future, probably in the length of the bid. So the economy would suggest, I think, to most of us that between now and 2021, we need to plan for our costs to keep going up, not 
the reverse. So that's what we're looking at and that's what we're recommending. But I think, so, uh, so my point about the property owner, I, I think as a property owner, the best money for me to invest in, in the community, this is the best way that I can think. I can't think of a better way than helping the homeless and cleaning our, our, our thing. I mean, I do donate to the homeless, but this is more of an effect on our company, on our, our community, than, than almost anything else we can do with our money. So I, I Fair point. think that as a property owner, I feel like it's our obligation to invest back in our community, and I think this is one of the best ways to do it, because it's all together and compounded with everything else. So, so to use CPI also while excluding wages, CPI doesn't include wages as far as I know. Well, if you go if you go into the details of CPI, it actually varies on different categories. So some things are a bit lower than three point one percent. The closest parallel in the Bureau of Labor Statistics is services. The cost of services is actually up. I think it's three point four or three point six. Point um, is that five housing seems, is up. Four five point seems high four, relative to that, but not including wages when that's our greatest impact would be somewhat deficient in our thinking to imagine that somehow we're going to get away with it because it looks a little bit better today, when in fact next year it's gonna be the same thing all over again. And we're gonna be pushed harder when we can't retroactively make the adjustment. This is so yeah, services is yeah. So, you know, taking off my treasurer hat, um, because I, I do, as a treasurer, I think it's fiscally, you have to go for 5%. Taking off my treasurer hat, I don't, want to have to ask stakeholders to go for the maximum every time. Also, I, I agree with Connie there. Um, however, in, you know, as I think about this, I think um, a couple of things. One, you know, we want this bid to continue beyond 2021. We want to go for renewal. And at some point, you know, reality is going to enter the equation. Right now, we're saying we don't want to do a 5% increase, but we're getting such a bargain right now. That's the reason, you know, we as stakeholders, my assessments are artificially low compared to the cost of what I'm getting. I'm getting a bargain, and I, as a stakeholder, am going to have to see that reconciled when the bid is renewed, because when the bid is renewed, we'll be using today's numbers, future value today, and looking at funding those costs, and they're gonna have to line up, and so, if our curve to get to that point is a little more, you know, um, exponential or steep, then it is. I think going like this and then jumping even faster is not necessarily sensible. Um, so, so that would be number one. Is I, I think we're all getting a deal now, and you know we have to to understand that. Um, and, well, I had something else in mind and I don't remember it exactly, but, uh, you know, the more I think about it, I just think that, yeah, minimum wage has gone up at a fast clip for a reason. You know, our uh, community of Los Angeles supports that. It supports taking Absolutely. care of its people. And you can't do that without feeling the cost of doing that. Um, and as business owners, we who employ people, we will feel that. And as stakeholders in the bid, we have to feel that. You know, we're trying to take responsibility in Los Angeles for homelessness, and we're taxing ourselves to do it. And we're trying to take responsibility um, in other ways, by raising minimum wage for people's, you know, uh, for poverty and things like that. And the bid is not immune to all of that. Um, 
So as a stakeholder, you know, as much as I really don't want to go to another stakeholder and say, well, I'm just going to raise it the max every time, it's not just about fiscal responsibility. It's also about um, responsibility to the, co the community and the desires for, you know, lifting people out of homelessness, lifting people out of poverty, and what kind of world we want to live in. And so I, I guess I would support a 5% increase. Jeff, any further comments? Again, I just think it helps ensure that we may not have to for the following subsequent years. Yeah. We're, talking, we're dealing with variables right now that we can't really determine. So to simply do it to look better, when in fact we won't when it comes to the higher costs that we might end up facing, wouldn't make any real sense. And I think that kind of balance is uh, community voted this in for 100% of the assessment twice. 5% doesn't seem to me to be a huge we did get difference. About twice. <laughs> <laughs> seems I'd to me, almost forgotten that. Right. Seems to me we're doing a job that people want it done and has never been done down here before. No, and I know it's distasteful to ask for that. To some people, it's distasteful that we're not functioning at all. So I don't want to use that as the guide. <laughs> I think we have to look at the numbers and do the work and get it done and figure out what they are. And once we know, we'll be able to respond accordingly and accurately. Right now, I think it's we're dealing with something that we didn't contemplate initially and couldn't. Okay, thank you, Jack. Any other comments, questions, or input before we take a vote on this? Okay. Um, with that, so the motion in front of us is to increase the assessment by five percent for the next calendar year. All in favor, raise your hand. I actually got to go. Okay. One, two, three, four, five in favor. All opposed? I think it's an abstain. And uh, uh, I'm abstaining as well. Okay. Two abstentions. Perfect. Um, so the motion to increase 5%, uh, the assessment 5% in the next calendar year passes. And, and Steve, our treasurer, and Tara, uh, and Marcus, um, thanks for all your, and I know Connie, you were involved in that too. Thanks for all your, your time and input. Uh, it's an important decision, and I think it's a good decision. Um, so we appreciate your, your help. And uh, we're gonna move on to item, oh, this is a great one. Here we go for <laughs> item 6B, which Everyone's is, which is dockless vehicles. Okay, so the staff will provide an update on the June 12th LADOT meeting in Venice and lead a discussion of the impacts of dockless vehicles on public safety within the bid. Dockless vehicles most notably include e-scooters and e-bikes, i.e. bird, jump, which is Uber, Lime, Metro bike, Motivate, Razor, Spin, Wheels, <laughs> Add anything else, if you will, et cetera. Okay, and this is uh, Ms. Devine and Ms. Bella. Um, so, uh, one issue that um, we as staff discuss quite often, um, regardless of how members of the community feel about the technology, its deployment, et cetera, um, when we share share in, in intensely personal ways um, those concerns. Um, four members of our safe, safe team have been struck by people on these scooters and by primarily the scooters. Um, we, uh, Asuzena and or I, met last year on at least two occasions with the primary operators at those times, uh, Bird, Lime, and uh, Uber Jump. Um, and I, I think a fair to charitable assessment would be that the people doing their community outreach at that time were full of nice words and praise for their technology, but had not, um, had not figured out a way to receive and act upon input um, in a way that would satisfy the community. Um, a couple of those companies had, had 
what I thought was an, an appalling amount of gall to ask for letters of support for their applications last year. Um, my response to them one and all was my community would roast me on a pyre. Um, no, if you are able to do this or this or this, and some of those things were things like geofence the boardwalk, these are not allowed on the boardwalk at all. If you get them off the boardwalk, if you um, can address some of the other concerns that we've raised, by all means, come back and ask me again. <laughs> but until then, the answer would be no. Um, the I think what we are what we are seeing. There was a meeting this week hosted by DOT. Um, all of the providers were present. Um, one of the things that pleased me on a personal level was that the caliber of the representatives from these companies has gone up a notch. I think they have hired people who have a bit more experience with community relations and government affairs. Um, I saw by and large better answers to a lot of questions from the community and community concerns. But I will also say from a pragmatic perspective, I think the single biggest thing that is making a difference in seeing some of these behaviors improve are really is really the timing. So the city approved um, last fall a pilot, proje pilot project based on applications and some other criteria. They allowed different operators to deploy X number of their devices in various communities. There were incentives for these operators to deploy some in the San Fernando Valley and in other disadvantaged areas of the city, including a lot of South LA, et cetera. In other words, they were allowed to deploy more of these devices if they put percentages in areas that are less likely to be served by them, trying to provide a range of transportation op options for areas like San Fernando Valley, which doesn't have the strongest public transit systems, or South LA, um, where um, these are often great for last mile connections or things like that for um, transit in those communities. Here's basically my personal take on this. Um, as we get close to the renewal of this program, as, um, as we move towards um, these companies being held responsible at council for what has happened in the last year since the pilot program started, I think there has been more serious and more concerted effort to address many of these issues. I think we're seeing some improvements now, and I do think we will be seeing more improvements more quickly in the coming months. Um, I also think a thing that has made a key difference is that LADOT has established um, a unit within the Department of Transportation that is um, tasked with coming up with recommendations, seeking of city council approval for enforcement actions or various other things. So I think LADOT is, is progressively getting more involved in regulating these devices and um, building up some teeth so that they can actually enforce these. So some of the recent things um, that have happened, um, effective, I think it was, was at the end of May, I believe? I think it was Memorial Day. Memorial Day. Memorial Day. Um, companies were required to institute geofences on um, Oceanfront Walk. It's astounding that it took nine months. Some of these companies put one in, took it out, put one in, took it out. But it took nine months. The majority of companies now do have a geofence in place for the boardwalk. If they do not have one, they are not supposed to be operating. We are aware of at least one that might be doing that. One of the problem issues, and this was a major topic of discussion at the Wednesday meeting, is that there are still renegade vehicles, so to speak. There are still vehicles that have not received the push update or the technology change to recognize the vehicle the, the geofence and slow the vehicles. So realistically, what you're gonna see, you should see a lot fewer of these scooters on Oceanfront Walk. And if you do see them on there, they should be traveling at vastly reduced speeds. I believe that LADOT is actually requiring them to reduce them to zero. So when they hit that zone, they should be slowing rapidly from <clears throat> certainly below five miles an hour, and they should be slowing to zero. However, there are some scooters that don't recognize the zone, and another apparent limitation of the technology is that if that rider's device is not currently connected to the internet, so like a gap in that cellular signal between the uh, scooter and the internet, could also allow that 
vehicle while it is not connected to continue at the higher speed. So there are still glitches in this. It is not perfect, but I do think as a community, we should see a lot fewer high-speed scooters on Oceanfront Walk, and we should see an overall tremendous reduction in them. Um, parking, parking of them. So another major topic of conversation was over-concentration and um, where they're being dropped off. So um, one of the things that we hi highlighted for them um, there's a lot of conversation amongst the providers about how they're improving a lot of things. One of the things that DOT found very helpful, I put together a small packet of actual photos of the scooters, um, uh, along with just a bulleted list of the concerns that we're, we're still seeing from these. And one of the things in the photos, I, when I gave it to DOT, I said, lest you think I've stacked the deck, all of these photos were taken in 25 minutes <laughs> on one day, three days ago. Um, and one of the things they demonstrate is that, you know, the chargers, some of these companies, they're, they're contractors, some of them are employees, that varies somewhat, um, but they're dropping them off en masse, often at red curbs, which is not where they're supposed to go, um, or in other areas in front of bike shops or other rental shops, which is terrible for their business, um, in front of businesses that need to get things in and out their door, et cetera. So I think a major area that LEDOT is working on right now is trying to refine where these are being dropped off. Venice, it, it appears to me, no, the community was not pulled in any way, shape, or form. Um, DOT uh, began this in downtown, apparently. They started going out and painting areas, the designated drop-off areas, so you might see some in Venice. They just did, I think it was about 25 in Venice and they are looking at potentially doing more. They will take input on where one should be added or where they will be or where they should be removed, um, but they didn't do a community survey process as part of this. So I would say that the current zones are probably being heavily informed from a traffic engineering standpoint, like not blocking visibility around corners and things like that and there there may not be as much sensitivity to use and what uses are near these zones so um, one of the things we're going to work to do is i'm looking to get the presentation from la dot um, and also um, the best way for folks to submit input on this i will say one thing that i observed at the meeting is that there are a lot of folks with a lot of complaints about scooters but the things that are most helpful to staff is something like an actual photo with a note or you know actual documentation they get a lot of narrative feedback but specific instance because one of the things LAD LADOT comes out here periodically but they're not out in our community every day like we are or like you are um, and so it was very helpful for me to be able to say to them here's here's seven photographs from a 25 minute window on Monday, on Tuesday morning Despite what everyone around the room is saying from the providers, I've got four photos for, for you of 20 plus scooters stacked at red curbs or falling over next to red curbs. Or in one instance, for example, um, this is something I've seen a couple of times now, um, where you have ADA zones, like the actual blue striped areas. I have seen chargers drop them off in mass in an ADA striped zone. So I had a photo of that, for example. I said, so, so I know there are improvements, but you need to also be aware that there are major ongoing violations of everything you're trying to do. So I think that was very helpful. Another thing I will say, um, LADOT is actually um, on a limited basis, but they are actually coming out to the field. They came out over uh, Memorial Day weekend to test random scooter units and see if they were in compliance with the geofence. So they are getting more involved, and I do think, I mean, I was, I was overall impressed with the caliber of the staff from this new unit within DOT. Um, um, but I would say, from a community standpoint, less rant and more specifics is more effective in getting them to change things. So like another issue we brought up that they weren't aware of because most of the people don't use these devices, one of the things that a lot of the companies have done recently, there used to be a tutorial that was part of the sign-up process. And granted, you could click through the tutorial of how you're supposed to ride it, what laws you're supposed to be compliant with, and you click through it awfully fast. Something I've noticed recently is that most of these providers have moved that tutorial to after you start your paid ride. 
And so that was something that was eye-opening to DOT is, you know, you're doubly disincentivizing people from taking the time to read how to operate the vehicle safely and what the laws are related to it when they're paying for the time that the tutorial is on the pop-up. So that's an example of an issue where I think they can move to address that. And I think they're, they're still working through that phase of trying to come up with some minimum standards for operators and evaluate those operators. But there is an intention on their part to try to do some more enforcement. One of the recommendations that came out of the recent transportation committee was um, for the city to work with LAPD and God bless them because they got plenty to do in our community, but the city is at least going to look at um, whether or not the operators might need to pay into a fund for some overtime for LAPD to do some enforcement related action to this. Um, I think they're also going to look at options of requiring potentially requiring operators to have some type of community enforcement. Our observation is that the companies, when they send representatives out to the field, they are promotional in nature rather than enforcement in nature. So um, that could certainly shift or help as well. Um, Asuzena, do you want to talk a little bit about what our folks actually experience with them? Um, actually, if you want to feel interested, I think it's genuinely involved. Um, so I'm really, I'm really happy with that. And then the other thing that we might want to add is that they really do want to start reporting to 311, to my 311. Um, they have a two hour, <laughs> right, they have a two hour turnaround to fix the problem. Um, I think that they're looking at maybe penalizing the companies now, anywhere from 500 to 1500 per scooter, per incident. So they really are, they really are starting to bring the reins in and, and, and perhaps even putting a cap in the amount that could be in the area, so that's really good. We have seen a notable decrease of scooters in the boardwalk. I mean, we maybe they've seen three in the last three days. So that definitely looks like a reopen to 14. Um, the canals, I don't think we saw too much of that, so I don't know when that was going on, yeah. but apparently the canals are still fenced as well. <coughs> so they're certainly holding true to what they're saying. Um, looks like they're vested, so we should see changes. We will see a little variation. Some of the companies' wheel fence extends a little further than others. Most, I believe all of them should be out to about Speedway but some of them are actually out to Pacific. So it, there is some variation and that continues to change and fluctuate. So, uh, Where do people uh, report uh, violations? Is there an email address, phone number, hotline? Mm -hmm. Where does it, what do people So I have a photograph of a slide from a presentation I'm trying to get a copy of. Um, there's actually a point of contact for every single vendor, um, uh, but I would, I would personally, although the vendors are stepping up and are being better, I think if you are going to invest your limited time in making a complaint, you're better off to do it to the city. Well, the, the, yeah, I, I was referring to the city since mm -hmm. the, you mentioned that the city. Mm -hmm. Is there from the 311 app? Oh, the, the, the 311 yeah. app, the, they have a specific yeah. sort of request for scooter violation? I have to go through and, and look I that up, but do. I think okay. they do. Sure, but I think okay, the DOT unit, does the DOT what? unit have a contact me? Um, DOT is going to be responsible for a lot of the oversight of the contract. In terms of the field, DOT isn't going to enforce But your photos, you're not sending your photos that you want taken to Venice 311, unidentified. No, you can also always, be, you're welcome to send in photos to the bid. Um, incidents I would really report are hazardous operation of them. So high speed, if you, if you have a high speed unit going down the boardwalk, if you're able to report that. Another incident that concerns us tremendously, these devices, all of them, require you to be a minimum age of 18. Unfortunately, under state law, you are not required to wear a helmet with them. So it is ultimately up, it is the choice of each individual rider, how much they value their brains. I, like mine, I wear a helmet. Most people don't. Um, I think it would, be, it would be great if we had more visibility of helmets. But um, did they talk about accidents and how they're, I mean, other than some screen with uh, instructions on how to operate that no one will look at, is there anything they're doing to address that? 
Um, I think a number of the companies are funding education campaigns. I I personally expressed um, I personally expressed a, a viewpoint to LADOT that there are certain aspects of these devices that they might want to look at coming up with standards for, like the tutorials and the instructions, or in other words, that if you leave it up to the individual companies, you're gonna get var varying results and, and non-effectual results, that you might wanna create some type of minimum standards of what you expect in terms of labeling, tutorial, that sort of stuff. Um, because I do think that's a big piece of it that's gonna take a lot longer. I think we're gonna see increase, we're gonna see a decrease in high speed use on public walkways, although not entirely because right now the GPS technology can't reliably tell the difference between sidewalk and street. So there's, it's still, you're still gonna see people operating these at high speeds on some of our sidewalks. I will say more of the units are being rolled out with clearer labeling that says don't ride them on the sidewalk, so hopefully it will come down. You can't take that long. The scooters don't last very long. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I think conflicts between the motorized vehicles and pedestrians in our community has gone down significantly and will continue to drop. I think where these scooters are being dropped off we're kind of still in the awful phase of that, but I think that's about to get steadily better soon. So those uh, sidewalk demarcations are suggestions? Yes. For, At this for, point, for, for, for they're on their drop-off locations for scooters? Is that what the city's trying to put yes. together? Yeah. Yes. On the side, not on the sidewalk, adjacent to the sidewalk? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. Generally close to the curb line, so they're not, so, because they want to allow it. Yes. Yes. How, um, I guess my... My question is, how can we be a benefit to our stakeholders as this process moves forward? I think realistically, we are we are part of the accountability wagon. So, I mean, I put together, and it didn't take all that much time. I probably spent a couple of hours on it total, um, and putting together that little packet of information where I had I had seven photographs, um, all but one were taken, like I said, in a 25 minute window um, of egregious things ranging from a mound of them this high to um, the domino effect of 30 tipped over next to a red curb uh, at near Windward and uh, or near uh, Pacific like in Mildred those sorts of photographs the fleet of them that were dropped off in the ADA you know striping etc being able when you take just a little extra effort rather than just writing a ramp to put together just a little something like that and I had a just simple bulleted list of these are these are things that we are seeing improvements with. These are things where we still see major issues. And I had a list of about 15 bullets. Um, that they said they said well the DOT person said to me we need stuff like this. They said because this is stuff where we can go back to when we pick a company. I'm just going to pick Uber randomly or Jump. When Jump says hey we're we're working with our our um, subcontractors or our employees to not get them to drop off in mass and blah, 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 et cetera. They have my photograph now that they can say, hey, here are your scooters. This was taken four days ago. Explain. <laughs> in other words, it's, it's, it's something where they can push back um, and we, say, well, you're not doing enough. Can we be part of the, or are we part of this conversation about where the drop-offs are? Because I think that's sort of the major back for probably me and other stakeholders. Mm -hmm. um, so there's ongoing conversations. So I would say the current status of that is they don't have the most organized way to take that input. They did say that there is um, a way to submit a request for a designated location. Um, I would say at this point, the best option I have now is if, if a location has been put in front of your business or if you don't, definitely don't want one in front of your business, you're gonna have to call LADOT chief staff and be be prepared to give them your address and the reason why you don't want one in front of your business. I have a quick suggestion, and I think this just came to my mind after you guys were discussing this for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I work with the clean team, and sometimes I find them in the street, and I was just thinking about my own personal dilemma of sweeping around them, or lifting them up, even though a lot of my friends like to knock them over. I understand all of that. Mm -hmm. But I thought about it as you guys discussed all of this, and I said to myself, this company is a big company. These companies are growing largely. Why can't they just own a storefront like other people own 
or a storage thing that they can pay for and put them into those things so that they and sell them out of a, a location. You know, when you go to a place and say, hey, I brought my scooter back when I finished with it. Here it is in your storefront, store it where you, where you store them at. And I come and I get it from your place, like the bike stores do. And like everybody else that ran businesses used to do, instead of throwing them on the street and everybody else has to deal with them. I hear you. <laughs> having them where it's people are yeah. is why they're, why they're. Yeah, that's the biggest problem we're having. They're in front of everybody else's store and in front of everybody, everywhere, everybody else's. I've seen people, old ladies walking around them doing Z's around them and people with strollers and because you can't control where the people bring them. Even if you tell them, look, bring them and put them in this square. But if you had a store or place to bring them to where you bought them from, then you just, that's what solved the problem like we used to do in the old times. I will say one of the weird things is that it improved, I think quicker than most things last year was not 100%, but where people were leaving them. There was an improvement in, in putting them out of the way and not directly in the sidewalk. Not 100% by any stretch of the imagination, probably not even 75%. But one of the reasons for that is because the vendors did update their apps at a certain point last year where when you finish your ride, you're asked to take a photo of the, of the parking. Mm -hmm. And just that mere requirement that you take a photo of the parking, and technically you could shoot the wall if you wanted to, et cetera, and they're not, the tr honest truth of it is, they're not actively monitoring this. Yeah. But they do have, they do have um, a program, there are people who can participate in a reviewing thing where they see pictures and you mark, has it been parked correctly or not. So there's some algorithm-based endorsement, not a lot. But just the psychological effect of adding that, take a photo of where you've parked it at the end of it, was tremendously helpful in getting better, getting people to select better places to drop them. Not perfect, but improved it. So I think that's another thing is that I think some of these things will be addressed a little bit through some technological, te technological improvements. Right now you have a lot of companies competing in a new marketplace for market share, and they're all over the place, and their apps and programs are different, and, and that's sort, sorting itself out. But yes, I do feel for the bike, um, the traditional um, transportation rental places, there was a person at the meeting Wednesday who operates one of those shops and said that from last year, his business was down $36,000 um, as a result of the new technology. So it is a disruptor to traditional businesses in our district They're as well. They're losing nothing but money. All right. Um, any other questions? Or And we'll try, I'm gonna try and get that presentation and some contact information and push that out. Um, we are mailing this. Thank you, thank you for the update, we'll watch it closely. Thanks to everyone for being here today. Thanks to the board. And uh, that's our last item. And so it is uh, 12.54 and this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>